Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is the, the fifth week of our Asia virtual uh, lecture series. And today we are proudly uh, to bring you Dr. Kevin Henry Vedarela. Uh, he is now doing the uh, research fellow, uh, distinguished research fellow in National Chongqing University, which is also uh, a fully supported uh, partners uh, in Taiwan uh, within our uh, framework of Asia Virtual Academy. Uh, so um, I would like to do a little bit uh, briefly introduction to Dr. Kevin Henry. Um, Dr. Kevin Henry has intensive uh, academic and uh, professional experience um, both in Europe and in Philippines. Uh, he is the first one to establish the university collaborate uh, in research, innovation, and development think tank between Taiwan and the Philippines. Uh, this, uh, the following areas will be doing the trans multi uh, discipline innovation. And about his uh, educational background, Dr. Kevin Henry was graduated from Ateneo de Malila for Bachelor of Arts in hum Humanities, and then he pursued its uh, diploma in Institute of, of uh, Politics in Paris. And he, he went to Europe for further uh, pursuit of his degree, uh, in all, associate in Latin American studies uh, in Spain, the University de Salamanca. And, all, and then he uh, pursued his uh, master degree in London School of Economics and Political Science uh, in UK. And he earned his Doctor of Philosophy, PhD in International Politics uh, at University of Leeds. So he has also a strong uh, academic background um, after graduate uh, from University of Leeds. Um, he is doing the vis visiting research fellow uh, at the University of Leeds and Fulbright Scholar in American University in Washington, D.C., United States. And for the past two years, he has been uh, the visiting professor in National Zhongzhen University and now currently uh, University of um, uh, National University of Chongqing. And he has also an extensive uh, international experience and professional networking. Uh, for example, like he's doing the research as in ASEAN and also the independent expert and consultant in Philippine Commission on Higher Education. And he's also the founding director of ASEAN Research Institute uh, for Strategic Studies and Enterprises. So, and he's also have extensive uh, publications uh, in the field of innovation, enterprises, and international relations. So today he's going to give us a talk about the role of university in the era of climate change, which also fits our overall themes of global uh, studies and sustainabilities. Uh, I, as you know, that uh, many of the major countries, uh, such like UK, uh, even the Amer United States of America, European Union, uh, has declared for its net zero um, carbon dioxide reduction plant. So what, what is the role for university uh, for reducing the carbon dioxide and for to adapt it to the climate change is also crucial, which could uh, reveal uh, the university role and social responsibilities. Okay, so um, that's the, uh, uh, the basic introduction to Dr. Kevin Harry Vedreras. So uh, without further delay, uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to Dr. Kevin. Kevin. All right. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Dean, Dean Cheng. Right. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to meet, uh, to meet you again. I've had the honor of being invited by Dean Cheng to uh, the National University of Kaohsiung. Right. On that occasion, I... Uh, was able to present initially this project. I uh, would also like to say thank you, all of those who can join us around the world, I take it, um, our colleagues 
and our students in the Philippines. Closer or here to home, um, around Taiwan. And as I understand it, we have an audience in Vienna. Uh, so I take it it is approaching lunch uh, in, in Vienna, most probably, right? And uh, I shall therefore try to be brief, but at the same time, um, interesting, um, interesting enough um, to share with you um, what I think um, deserves our attention as academics, as scholars, students, in an age when we finally understand and agree that our resources are finite. And unless we take care of them, specifically from the standpoint of the university, I don't see how we can persuade the rest of the world or the succeeding generations how to take care of our planet. I think if we have to start, I think we have to start in academia. Right? Simply because this is where we challenge, right? we study right? um, how the world works primarily. Okay. We are given the time to repose and think about the issues which matter to us most as humankind. So the title initially of the talk was the, the role of the university in an era of climate change. Quite an ambitious um, title. Um, but that's, that's, that's because I said to myself, um, we'd like to get an audience here. But um, I'd like to make a disclaimer, right? It is a title that is rather too ambitious, uh, but it is the framework in which this presentation is going to be. The title of this presentation is called The Open Blue Ring. Okay. Um, I, I take it that everybody who is watching can see the slide. Okay. So the open blue ring here is what I call a coalition, a movement. This is a de the genesis of an idea. So there is nothing as yet definitive about what I'm about to uh, present. Now, the Open Blue Ring is a project right, that we wish to launch here between Taiwan and the Philippines. And it's a project that we would like to launch between primarily two networks of universities. Okay. It's called the Open Blue Ring we are looking specifically at a group of universities which are situated in Ireland. Okay. And they are, they are situated in this maritime region. Uh, the reason for that is because our islands are the most vulner vulnerable geographic features in, um, in this climate crisis. And if we are to understand the climate crisis, I think it's important that we look back a little, we look back at climate as a global agenda. Okay. Climate as a global agenda can be traced back to the 1987 Brundtland Report, which was commissioned back then by, um, by, if I'm not mistaken, Javier Perez de, uh, Perez de Cuellar. All right, who's then Secretary General of the United Nations. Okay. Um, and he was he commissioned here uh uh this uh Gro Harlem Brundtland in 1987, okay. Um actually in 1983, um to make a to come up with a report. Okay. Right. Brundtland was a member of the Commission on Security and Disarmament. She was Norway's first woman prime minister, chairman of the World Commission on Environment and Development. Oh, Once, oh. excuse me. 
Uh, Professor Kevin, uh, would you like yes. to share your screen for your files or? Oh, I'm sorry. I am sorry. <laughs> I think you forgot to share. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank, no problem. All right. All right. Can I see anyone? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it helps to see someone. <laughs> just so, just, just to know that, uh, uh, how, how's this? I have a nod of, uh, I have a nod of approval that it's going, slides are going well. Can you see it? Yes? Thumbs yeah, up. Sure. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. All right. So now I am. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So the the open blue ring. Okay. Right. I uh, for the, the some of you may have already seen this. All right. Especially this is a project that I'm sharing with Dean Ching. All right. And hopefully we'll be launching with the National University in Kaohsiung. So it's called the Coalition, a Movement and a Vision. And as, as I was saying, it is a project on climate change, specifically mitigating to, um, climate climate change from the perspective of the university. But to be able to understand that, I think it's, just, it's important that we look back a little at the, um, at the Brundtland report, okay. which was commissioned by the UN Secretary General in 1980, um, eventually published in 1987. Okay. So um, what were the defining features of, this, of, the, of the report? nations represented in the World Commission on Environment and Development, which was, which was chaired by um, by uh, by Gro Harlem uh, Brundtland, okay, by the chairperson. The, the 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 report talks about successes and failures. Um, what were some of these? Widening a widening gap in resources between rich and poor nations. The industrial world dominates in the rulemaking in key international bodies and has used much of the planet's ecological capital. Many development trends leave many people poor and vulnerable, while at the same time degrading the environment. New technology slows down rapid consumption of finite resources versus new forms of pollution and new variations of life forms that could alter evolutionary pathways. A global economic system that takes more than it fits in. Looking at excessive forms of capitalism and consumerism, efforts vis a vis human progress, human needs, human ambition draw heavily too quickly on already overdrawn accounts. The point is, we're actually borrowing, all right? We don't own the resources, all right? Uh, the commissions, uh, the report says. Yes. In that report, there are six priority areas, okay, or what it calls policy directions for the UN and eventually for institutions and mechanisms that would be put in place in the wake of this report. The first is population and human resources. The second is food security, sustaining the potential. Um, species and indeed, and systems, energy, choices for environment and development, next industry producing more with less, and finally the urban area. Now, if you look at the question here, I think is important, is uh, one important notion that I think has to be clear is, you know, what we mean by sustainability. And the report is important precisely because for the first time, it puts and defines sustainability as a global agenda, one that can no longer be simply um, tackled by um, a chosen set or a select set of institutions, okay? but one that, as it were, would no longer have any borders. Okay? What does it say about um, sustainability? 
Um, here are a couple of uh, excerpts which I have taken from the report. Humanity has the ability to make development sustainable, to ensure that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. All right. So the, the whole idea that it's not only about saving for, for, for now, all right, but looking at generations in succeeding, in a succeeding sequence, um, ambitious, because the idea is um, to make finite resources infinite. Concept of sustainable development provides a framework for the integration for the integration of environment policies and development strategies. The term development being used here in its broadest sense. The word is often taken to refer to the processes of economic and social change in the third world. But the integration of environment and development is required in all countries, rich and poor. So the duty and the responsibility no longer belongs only to those who can afford, but also those who cannot afford. The pursuit of sustainable development requires changes in the domestic and international policies of every nation. Sustainable development seeks to meet the needs and aspirations of the present without compromising the ability to meet those of the future. Far from requiring the cessation of economic growth, because previous to this, the dominant model for development was economic growth. It recognizes that the problems of poverty and underdevelopment cannot be solved unless we have a new era of growth in which developing countries play a large role and reap large benefits. Environmental protection is thus inherent in the concept of sustainable development as is a focus on the sources of environmental problems rather than the symptoms. And this has repercussions in terms of policies and policy implementation with regard to sustainable development is lodged in the various national ministries of the countries. Next, it says that no single blueprint of sustainability will be found in the concept, will be found as economic and social systems and ecological conditions differ widely among countries. Okay, I like this particularly. No, it says no single blueprint of sustainability. Right? So there's a sense here that each, uh, what, it, what it's really trying to say is that it's a sustainability model that ought to emerge from some kind of consensus from the bottom up. Okay. Each nation will have to work out its own conclusions and policy implications. Yet, irrespective of these differences, sustainable development should be seen as a global objective. No country can develop in isolation from others, hence the pursuit of sustainable development requires a new orientation in international relations. And I think this is also particularly interesting because the whole discipline of international relations was um, founded on questions of war and peace. If you look at um, our founding fathers post-1945 or during or between the, the two world wars, the questions were predominantly about why the world wars happened. All right, Each nation will have to Sorry, long-term sustainable growth will require far-reaching changes to produce trade, capital, and technology flows that are more equitable and better synchronized to environmental imperatives. The mechanics of increased and international cooperation to ensure sustainable, sustainable development will vary from sector to sector in relation to particular institutions. But it is fundamental that the transition be managed jointly by all nations. The unity of human needs requires a functioning multilateral system that respects the democratic consent 
and accepts that not only the earth but also the world is one. Finally, overall, they say that the report carries a message of hope, but it is hope conditioned upon the establishment of a new era of international cooperation based on the premise that every human being, those here and those who are to come, has the right to life and to a decent life. We, con we, we confidently believe that the international community can rise as it must to the challenge of security, of securing sustainable human progress. Now, um, a critique, as it were, uh, 21 nations represented in the World Commission on Environment and Development, right? Uh, we're still trying to see the exact uh, composition of, of nations, but I think what's interesting here is that there are, um, there are entities, all right, um, which are not represented in the UN. And I think this is particularly poignant in the case of Taiwan. Okay. So um, how much or the quality of the input in the report even if indeed there were um, more than a dozen consultations, I take it, that were undertaken around the world, um, they were undertaken. How much um, does the report actually include all right, the experience of, and I, I, I cite that in, in number four, um, the experience of islands, islands slash archipelago. This is the case of islands in the Philippines and in the Malayan archipelago, such as Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, the report also seems to have, um, there's certain gaps, all right? It's, it's not very clear how academia um, um, ought to contribute to the, uh, to the global agenda. This, of course, was the very first, the very first report of its kind, all right? Um, what are regional bodies doing? And here I'm thinking about Southeast Asia, okay, um, specifically ASEAN. Uh, finally, what role for the humanities? Because a lot the report has been heavily has heavily leaned on um, on the scientific, the hard sciences, the natural science, the community of the natural sciences. So here I um, I quote again, okay. Um, what uh, an excerpt of the report in terms of the vision and the idea of the agenda. So here, no single blueprint of sustainability as economic and social systems and ecological conditions differ widely among countries. Each nation will have to work out its own concrete policy implications. Yet, irrespective of these differences, sustainable development should be seen as a global objective and so on. Now, for those of us who want to engage, uh, wish to uh, associate ourselves to this idea of the open blue ring, what I suggest is that our philosophy and mission as humanists and scientists in academia is to work hand in hand, specifically for our islands and seas, that together as people we may, we may live in greater prosperity. So it is looking at the sustainability specifically of islands, not just cities, a different ecosystem. All right. The point of our departure to understand how islands can be made livable is the point at which we understand how finite renewable sources can be made sustainable for the people who live on the island and move across the seas. So here um, we are trying, we are, we are going to try to look into how we can mobilize the academic community on, um, on a set or on the basis of three questions. First is, do we as one academic community, and we're looking at NCHU, we're looking at the University of the Philippines, and of course, NU, NUK, um, feel a duty, all right, to respond to the climate emergency. Number two, do we see Taiwan as an island in solidarity with other islands? Okay. Because we're fundamentally or basically action that is, so to speak, outside of the state, another social actor such as academia. We as humanists and scientists in academia see ourselves as members of a wider international global community. So here we're trying to look at where the moral obligation or the moral imperative comes from. Okay. What therefore, 
in order to begin our investigation, do we mean by sustainability in the way that it has come upon the conscience of humanity, as well as for the people for whom the islands are most vulnerable in an era of climate change. So here, what we're trying to do is, what we propose is that we uh, begin to look at whether we can actually share a sustainable sustainability ethical code for those universities who wish to be part of this of the of, of the blue ring okay uh, what you see there now on the on, on the slide is a comparison between the university of leeds i've chosen the university of leeds because it is my alma mater right i know it quite well and um it has uh, garnered excellent performance in terms of the last time's higher education ranking in terms of its sustainable development agenda. Okay, Number three in the UK, number 11th in the world. Okay. And what they have are overarching principles, but here in our case, we're looking at um, a sustainable ethical code along principles. Uh, number one is we are united in consensus as one academic community. Principle to study and protect life on land and below in water. Incidentally, these are two of 17 UN SDGs. Three, principle three, we value and prize teaching and research excellence in sustainability. And uh, principle four, we are one in solidarity with universities and the global. Uh, um, I won't get into that. Okay. But, uh, you can observe from the slide, all right, what each of these principles actually means. The idea would be for each of these universities to undertake a survey okay, um, and to undertake a policy session, brainstorming session amongst all of the departments, all right, gradually looking at how these principles can then be operationalized in terms of strategies. So how can they actually be made to work? And if you have four principles here, right, the idea is for the entire, all network, all universities participating in the network, sharing these principles, except that is to say, or modifying principle number three, which is an excellence in teaching and researching sustainability. Because here specifically, the university would have to look, or each university would have to look at its own thrust, academic and research thrust. All right. Here we have, to give you an idea, how the coalition will look like. So we've got two islands, two university networks, and the maritime region. The maritime region, the maritime region being um, Southeast Asia, East Asia. Okay. And in terms of the Philippines, first we're looking specifically at Central Philippines, which is the region of the Visayas. Okay. In the region of the Visayas, we're looking at three universities: the University of the Philippines in the Visayas, which is the premier state university, the state constituent unit. One of them is um, our three campuses here in, um, here in Western Visayas. That is the island of Panay that you see there, the triangular island. And then towards the right is the island of Negros, which actually looks like a boat, pretty much like Italy. Okay. Now, um, West Visayas State University is in the province of Iloilo. The University of the Philippines is in the province of, uh, of Iloilo. We have one in Tacloban, in the city of Tacloban, and then another one on the outskirts of, in another um, town, uh, also in the province of Iloilo, no longer part of the city. West Visayas is one Philippine normal school, okay, and that school was originally established by sites. The very first Americans came to the Philippines to uh, uh, house this, um, establish the public educational system. And finally, we have Siliman University, which is in the city of Negros. 
Negros Oriental. Okay. And then in the case of Taiwan, we are looking at three universities. One in the north, the center, and the south. In the south, our proposal, obviously, is the National University of Kaohsiung with Jin Xing. And then we, um, we, we are the ones here at National Chungxing University who would like um, to be the hub for the universities here in central Taiwan. And we are looking for a partner in the north. Now, the idea will be to establish open working groups. Okay. Open working groups in each of these universities and one then um, coordinate the working groups in the three universities. Open working groups will transform climate change from a marginalized to an urgent concern in academia, requiring collective action. Um, number two, it will translate the complexity of climate science and politics into summaries for university policies. And number three, it will turn climate action as a central and integral component of the internationalization of the university. Now, we've started. Um, and these are some of the academics uh, with whom we've already had conversations. Okay, I won't get into uh, their specific answers, but we've started looking at how we can approach sustainability if we're going to be creating or establishing targets in the various universities. We would have to look at how each of the colleges or how each of the departments looks at um, or believes the sustainability framework ought to be. Terms of targets, if we're looking at say carbon emissions, what kind of gases, what kind of carbon emissions we're looking at. Um, if we're going to be eradicating plastic, um, and so on and so forth. This, uh, this working group is at the National Tung University. Um, we are, uh, Dean Xing should be here. I've, um, I'm, unfortunately, my computer crashed. I was not able to have more time to actually update the slide. So my apologies for that, okay? It's been a nightmare, all right. Here at the University of the Philippines, all right, um, I've started making consultation with our academics from the various campuses all over the country, all right? So UP stands for the University of the Philippines. Now, so as a movement, you've see, we've seen the vision, we've seen um, how the coalition can look like. As a movement, um, we were looking at the following goals and targets in the immediate, intermediate, and long term. Okay. In the uh, in the uh, immediate, we're looking at uh, possibly a co-authored paper of publishable quality on island environmental governance and sustainability. Um, establish the open working groups. Okay, in Taiwan. We would like to uh, and connect with ADB. I've already had conversations with the Asian Development Bank and tap into their climate change fund. Okay. So uh, we are be able to meet with them and we are in conversation. Uh, but uh, that is now being negotiated. Then we're looking at a roadmap on the readiness of the university for implementing the UN Sustainable development goals. The idea here is to come up with a baseline study. Um, where are we actually at? Once we have a framework for sustainability and once we agree on the sustainability ethical code, um, how are we actually doing in terms of that framework? And then, um, and then look at you know, the next year, the next three years, and the next 10 years. In the medium term, and we're looking at three um, we would like to uh, even possibly use the Asia Virtual Academy for a summit, okay, of of universities, okay, based or during that summit, see if we can actually come up with the the the, the ethical code for cooperation and action amongst the members of the Blue Ring. Third we will consolidate a criteria for monitoring and evaluation. So look at our own benchmarks okay, as a community of universities in the region. And then 
draft an eight-year climate strategy plan as part of the internationalization strategy policy of the university. Okay, and this and this includes the creation of an incubator for collaborative research and training site. We're thinking here of um, programs that would specifically respond okay, to um, climate change studies, for example. And then um, submit an application for climate change funding right, for the network and possibly for projects within uh, within the ring. Yeah. Over the long term, we'd like to look at ideas. I won't get into this now. This is we're looking at um, uh, the interdisciplinarity of. Of, of climate change as an area of studies. Secondly, we um, consolidate and create a coalition of SDG ready universities, right? And finally, an infrastructure for collaborative research and training sites. So that would be taking on from the internationalization strategy after the first three years. Okay. Um, Okay, um, I don't think I shall get into this, all right, to leave some, some time, all right, for Dean Shing and myself to um, possibly entertain questions from the audience. But uh, this is part of my own work um, as, a, as a humanist and a, as a philosopher. My area, my area of, of interest and specialization is is on uh, international relations, international politics, but specifically looking at um, new mo new forms um, of potential decision making in the world, uh, but from the perspective of humanity. Okay. So it's looking at actors outside of the society or the international society of states. And my interest in sustainability has been, or the climate crisis, has focused not only on the climate crisis as a problem of the environment, but I think uh, more profoundly, uh, a crisis that is happening in our story, okay, as, as a species. So um, if we look at the 20th century, it, I think has been a struggle not only of or a history of um, uh, of this of of environmental degradation, all right, but our struggle against each other, all right. So here it's not only a crisis of sustainability, but possibly a crisis of humanity itself. Right? So I think these are questions that we have to ask ourselves, whether we're actually looking at saving the environment but also looking at the kind of international cooperation um, that we are undertaking in, in the world. So let me, let me end there. Right? Um, I wish to thank you again. Um, I wish I could see your faces. Um, this, this new mode of presentation is, uh, is cold. <laughs> um, our, our wish is to be uh, together. Uh, I hope there will be a chance uh, that we go, you know, back soon um, to in person uh, meeting each other, flesh and blood. All right, because I think this is how we actually as people, not through machines, all right, but uh, by being together and by sharing our ideas all right, in in person. Thank you very much. Okay, so I was given 40 minutes. Uh, it's 39 minutes, right? Okay, so I'm well within uh, the time allotted for me. Okay. Do we have any questions? Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Kevin's uh, sharing. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful speech. Um, and um, we'll talk about even for the philosophy uh, perspective of climate change and how we uh, uh, survive from this extremely uh, crisis. Um, as a university, I, I think 
the over thing of this uh, uh, lecture series is about the sustainability. So I, I think Dr. Kevin has just read up all the uh, idea and concepts um, about how the human can combat, uh, combating the uh, uh, climate change effects. And um, of course, for our UK, uh, we are also devoted and um, incorporating the SDGs and uh, into our curriculum planning and our uh, university governors. So, uh, well, the climate change is also in the SDG uh, 13, right? That's the climate actions. And I think the university itself should um, consider uh, its own, like just like Dr. Kevin just mentioned, but short-term and intermediate and long-term plan. Um, so um, in response to um, the sovereign, sovereign states uh, declaration of then zero, uh, I mean, I mean the new uh, the carbon ne neutral uh, planning. Um, I think we will have to propose um, a project for university uh, for up the fifteen years terms of how we uh, deal with the energies and how we protect our biodiversity in the campus, um, and about how we uh, pursue for renewable energies. Uh, in NUK, uh, we have established several uh, uh, solar uh, patios for energies. And uh, as uh, Dr. Kevin just mentioned, that Philippines and Taiwan is quite similar. Uh, we share uh, a lot of the sunshines. And in Taiwan, uh, in the western coast of Taiwan, is also a very good uh, wind power farms. I don't know whether uh, Dr. Kevin know. Uh, or you yeah. would like to give us some comments uh, because the it is we the government of Taiwan is uh, proposing uh, a very comprehensive uh, renewable energy pro uh, plan. Um, so we would like to increase uh, the portfolios uh, energy uh, metrics uh, for renewable energies to twenty percent in two thousand fifty. So. Um, I think university should do a lot of work and we can do our contributions to uh, to respond to the, the national policies. Not just in Taiwan, I think also in Philippines or uh, Indonesia and in Vietnam. Uh, we, we could all, like uh, for a couple of weeks ago, um, Dr. Uh, Tree uh, also mentioned about the, the, uh, the bio safety and food securities it's also uh, respons uh, responsive to uh, the climate change. And because no non university, uh, and as National Chongqing University is quite similar, uh, was very good in the research field of uh, food securities and for agriculture sciences. So uh, I think there's many university uh, could see the way or approach uh, to deal with the climate crisis. And not only we can do it in the campus, but we can also expand uh, our influence to the to the communities or even to the governments, doing some advisement to to the government policymakers. Um, and uh, I'm I'm apologies that I don't I skipped the uh, the introduction to Dr. Uh, Tree. He's also online. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Tree, was, would you like to uh, give us some welcome uh, and, and and a message? Yeah, and also your insight for uh, comments to Dr. Kevin's uh, uh, wonderful speech, okay? Yeah, okay. please. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. Yeah, thank you very mm -hmm. much, Dr. Kevin, for giving a very insightful uh, presentation. And yes, um, when I see the topic on the role of universities in climate change, uh, yeah, it's uh, so to me, it's very appealing and uh, Thanks again for your very comprehensive um, uh, holistic uh, uh, views of, uh, of climate change, especially to learn more about the uh, Taiwan, especially NCHU's um, approach to the problems. Uh, uh, Vietnam's like Taiwan's and in, and and Philippines also face the uh, you know. Uh, um, 
the problems uh, uh, we what we call the double effect at, uh, um, actually it's in, 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 in the especially in the Mekong Delta we are in the we are suffering the double effects of the climate change is the water rising or uh, because of the you know uh, increase in temperature global uh, temperature and also because of some human intervention or uh, developments in the upstream of Mekong Delta that prevent the fresh water coming from the uh, you know, from China, Laos, Cambodia to to the the, our, the the Mekong Delta. So that's really um, big problem now. And at our university, we also established about uh, uh, less than ten years ago. We 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 established the research center for climate change, where you know um, uh, our our um, our staff, faculty from different department. Uh, uh, we we approach problem from the interdisciplinary uh, uh, point of view. I, I mean, we have different department, department, uh, different discipline from the university and and us, uh, our 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 faculties uh, together to tackle the problems and uh, both at the uh, from the the mitigation and also the adaptation, uh, you know, uh, strategy. So. Uh, those um, uh, and um, yes, I would uh, <laughs> would like to hear more about the. You talk about the coalition of uh, that's who are talking in NCHUs and and unfortunately, that we 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 haven't joined with you in that. But uh, I, I think that in the future maybe we can work together. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Thank you, sir. You, I'm thinking as you were talking, uh, but two points. The first point is, uh, I, I don't know if the questions in the audience, but one question that I am sort of anticipating is, why this kind of a coalition, right? Why, why this kind of a, why, why an open blue ring? Hmm. Uh, primarily, I, I see three, Three reasons. The first is because we share the same climate. So we are looking at an area of monsoons, right? We're looking at an area that's visited by typhoons, very prone to natural disasters. And therefore, we share the same threats, the same threats, all right, to our the livelihood of our communities. And because they're the same climatic threats, um, it, I think it's it, it's obvious, all right, that the kind of responses will not differ greatly, right, in terms vis vis vis, -a -vis right, the natural, you know, the, the environmental threat, but it will differ greatly in terms of the capacities of our all right, because of you know uneven economic development, uh, primarily I think. So here the university, and this is where um, uh, okay, that's one. Secondly, is culturally okay. Um, even if we are not politically the same, I think as you know Southeast Asians, as Asians, all right, we have always um, traveled around. Um, around the region. And I think we understand each other more um, uh, compared to say how we might understand Europeans or Americans. Although in the case of the Philippines, that might not actually be. But I think um, in, in, in terms of our cosmological dis disposition life, all right, we are, um, how should I say this? Um, there's a sense of mysticism, all right? share okay in terms of our um in terms of our faith beliefs and our cultures okay uh, um so, uh, thirdly because of our proximity kind of technology or the resources that we, we can potentially share will also be easier for us to move around in the region okay. i this is another reason why 
um, I think uh, a kind of, this kind of a coalition is, um, can be potentially uh, be fruitful because uh, some might argue, why don't we um, partner with universities outside of the region? I'm not saying that we should. I mean, we, we cannot or that we shouldn't. I'm simply saying that um, there are advantages that I explored because the case has been that most of us professors have also been educated outside of the region. Okay. And I, I, I think now is a good time to actually explore this because the kind of threat, like I say, is um, more real for those of us who are neighbors. Okay. Now, um, there's also a strategic dimension to this, which is as universities are being, we are being measured, okay, in terms of our contribution to uh, the sustainable development goals. But again, the criteria here, all right, is questionable. On what basis, all right, and on what standards are we being are we going to be measured, all right, as universities in the region? I think I think it's important that we have to create our own set of criteria of how responsible we are as an academic community, okay, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the climate crisis. Okay. Now, finally, uh, based on that question. Um, is how do we uh, lodge such a, a movement, such a ring, such a coalition, all right? Do we look at uh, international relations, the, depart the departments or the programs of international relations, or do we look at, like you say, the research centers, all right, related to climate change? I think it's best to actually meet and decide because at the end of the day, these networks are actually being managed by by people, uh, but I think it's uh, it's again, you know, I think it's it's an in, it's 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 important. It's a crucial. It's an interesting um, factor. Okay, to um, right, it's an important factor to actually think of. How can such a coalition? How can such a ring um, take off? Is it going to be from? deans, the vice presidents of international relations of these universities in our region coming together for a summit? Or are we looking at the directors of these research institutes, which are um, uh, uh, taking on climate, climate change or the climate crisis as a research agenda, right? Or a combination of both. So, um, Dean Shing, I, I think uh, I think we've got work here if we are serious about this, okay? And I think we are. Um, although you know the, the question is uh, uh, time and money. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. And, and this is this is not ours. It sounds like it's ours, but it really isn't, because the whole the spirit of the project is consensual. So um, this is a proposal. But if the academic community, the staff and students, don't pick it on, then, you know, this will you know, be a blue dream. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I appreciate for uh, your force for initiating this Open Blue Ring uh, project that you have just uh, discussed with me when you visit NUK uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And I think it's time for us to proceed to the question and answer uh, session. Um, so uh, before uh, you, the participants to type your questions uh, on the chat box, uh, I think we will have a little bit ice breaking uh, period. And during this ice breaking period, you can type your questions and I will allow uh, Dr. Kevin to have more time to read the questions and to think uh, which is a priority question you'd like to answer. Okay, yes. okay. so um, yeah, before that, right. I think we'll take a break and for our... <laughs>
Uh, three minutes, but, five minutes. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, about three minutes, I think. Yeah, three minutes, a little game for uh, all the students and participants online. Okay. And in the meantime, please just uh, you have, if you have any questions or comments uh, and what you, how to proceed the climate change and how you uh, think about uh, the students or professors or even the government, uh, the uh, the university itself to uh, uh, deal with the uh, issues of uh, the climate change. Anything you, you'd like to uh, to share or to ask uh, Dr. Kevin, this is a good opportunity for you. Okay, so uh, we would like to proceed to the uh, uh, the ice breaking times, and we allow you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kevin, to read the questions. All right, please. <clears throat> Hi, let's proceed to the ice breaking session. Um, I'm Anna. Did you miss me? <laughs> Good afternoon. Okay, I'm Anna, and we will do three guessing games. And participants can join us and type your answer in the comments. Okay, the let's start. The first question: What has to be broken before you can use it? Please type your answer. Let's see if there is any correct answer in the comments. Ooh, you can see the PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, let's try. We'll try again. Ah, yes. I see lots of answer. Okay. Yes, the answer. Let's move to the answer. Sorry, we have a little technical problem. Finally, wait. Um. Okay. okay, it works now. Um, the answer is egg. Okay. Oh, and the next question. How can you break without touching and even seeing? Without touching. Oh, yes. Yes, I I like the both answer promise and heart. Our our answer is promise, but I like the answer heart. Okay. And the Last question. A prisoner is forced to go into one of three rooms. The first room is a place with fire. In the second one, there are explosives that will go off as soon as he enters. The third contains a pair of lions who haven't eaten in years. The question is, which room should he choose to survive? Let's see if there's any correct answer. Yes, you guys are so smart. I see lots of answer correctly. Yes, the third room. 
because any lion who haven't eaten in years would be dead. Yeah, <laughs> you guys did a great job. Thank you for thank you for joining the ice breaking section. Let's proceed to the Q and A section. Okay, um, so yeah, I think you are all smart. Uh, you also answer the third question, especially uh, for the lions, because I, I haven't uh, any clue yet, but I think many of you just answered it correctly. So uh, you are all smart. Okay, um, so um, I, I don't know whether you have like any questions because uh, I, I know there is some difficulties uh, for you from your feedback that it, maybe the, the PowerPoints and for the, the size of the fonts. Um, but you know, I, I think you can ask any questions, uh, not just restricted to uh, Dr. Kevin's uh, speech about this um, university's role. Um, you can you can ask any journal. Uh, question concerning climate change or international relation because uh, I think Dr. Kevin is uh, experts um, and he work uh, not just in Asia but uh, with a, a long and rich um, academic and professional experience in Europe as well. So uh, I think he asked many uh, general questions and even about international relations and what happened uh, when we're facing these global challenges. Okay. Okay, so uh, before uh, you type your question, I have uh, one question to ask uh, Dr. Kevin um, about your correlation and, and about your role of university in, in the era of climate change. Um, could you give, it, give us some of the uh, comments concerning that? This, what is the role for students, uh, for university students to, um, to do their part uh, for the climate actions? Or if, if any examples uh, yeah, based on your past experience or your observations uh, in many countries. Well, I'll be very honest. Um, the um, this is the first time that I'm actually launching the project. Or uh, excuse me, project. I can hear your voice. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Hear your voice. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. 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 Yeah, I can hear you. I can't, I, I can't hear your voice now. Okay. Um, okay. Is there any technical problem with that microphone? Uh, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. So. Oh. Okay, so please, please. Um yeah. Please. Yeah. Dr. Okay. Kevin, uh, I think well, could you start on your answering? You know, there this uh, at the top of my head, right? Well, first of all, this is um a disclaimer. This actually is the first time that um, I am thinking trying to get the university on board a sustainability a sustainability um, from the point of view of students all right one most popular uh, project has been Simply, uh, simply the simply the use of uh, recyclable materials in school, all right, in campus. Okay. Um, hello. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I think yeah. it's kind of uh, technical problems from outside, but oh yeah, but no I, problem. I think the yeah. audience could hear you clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, you know, any uh, just looking at the very you know, classic um, popular um, house this programs in school at the University of Leeds. Um, Recyclable cups were being used, all right, for coffee, right? So we're not using plastic. We're not using uh, disposable plastic. We're not using. Um, uh, we're in, instead we're using recyclable cups, and we get discounts for that. Okay. So we, you know, in terms of 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 um, zero plastic, the university or the Right, are, is, is, is trying to come up with business models whereby students actually um, cut down and business That's establishments don't high. use plastic anymore. Okay, thank okay. you very much. I think we have some questions coming up, right? Um, yeah, please. Which 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 question you would you like to answer? Uh, you can uh, name his. I'll mention her, uh, her, his name and questions, and we will pop it up. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. So, any questions uh, you like to answer first? Uh, yeah. Please say it. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, so these questions, all right. Um, question of Alina, uh, Miss Pamplona, all right, of Freddy Fernandez, right? It's, I mean, these are all interesting questions. Actually, these are questions that you should be answering um, as, as students and as colleagues, right? She says here, what can the coalition do contribute to national disaster mitigation, especially in the Philippines that is visited by an average of 20, 20 typhoons per year? The my initial reaction is, do we not do anything just because there are 20 typhoons? Doesn't this project make, make actually, make it more urgent that we think about how we can actually help mitigate, not prevent typhoons because they're natural occurrences, right? The university. We're looking at specifically how the university, all right, can help. All right. So, are we looking at in the case of, uh, in the case of typhoons? Are we we're looking at housing, for example? How will academics look at zoning problems? Looking at hot spots of the you know in, in islands where um, how's this zoning uh, uh, policies on zoning have to be clear citizens to avoid when there are floodings, right? There are a host of, uh, there are a host of problems around the situations that I can think of when typhoons happen. The universities, both in, the, in terms of their programs, especially the University of the Philippines, we're looking at community service or extension services. How can they actually contribute to the policy development of zoning in their areas so that um, so that houses are therefore warned of potential zones where um, flooding okay, um, is a constant problem. Okay. So um, this is where we would like to be, to come together okay, and see what specific problems there are in communities. Look, you know, for example, the idea is to, you to actually mobilize the students within the in their campuses and in their barangays, okay, and look at what kinds of problems these typhoons generate, right, and what kind of research projects can the universities um, actually contribute. So my question, for example, for um, for, for Ms. Pamplona is, where are you in the Philippines? What kind of typhoon problems does your community? Actually, all right, encounter. And what is the university doing? Okay. 
I'd like to hear from you because I think the, this is the this is the whole purpose of actually coming and presenting the project to the wider community. Okay. Yeah, we still have some questions, and I think it's from Freddie, right? Yeah, all right, Freddie. This yeah, pandemic, yeah. all right. Yeah, that's a good question. Does it bring us good impact for environment? Man, can reduce their eco footprint. How do we maintain to reduce our eco footprint after this pandemic? And yeah, uh, yeah well, you know, we, that for me is also a question. Again, we have to focus to say this is this is this is what's extremely difficult, uh, Mr. Because universities do not have a sustainability framework, that is, okay, when you're looking specifically at the campus, all right, the whole, the, this, the objective of the project is consciously think about their own eco footprint. So in the case of the University of the Philippines in Manila, a couple of years back, the campus has deliberately shifted all right, to solar panels, okay? That means that we're now looking at renewable energies and not using um, orthodox, um, um, how's this, um, um, sources of, of energy. So even, even the rate, even uh, the bills have been reduced by half. Now, it is important that each campus, each university campus, therefore thinks about how, which kind of footprint, footprint do they actually want to reduce when they're looking at gases, then are you going to be also looking at the number of um, how's this the number of cars which enter the university? Are you going to be encouraging students all right um, uh, to carpool? okay? There's a, a host of projects that can be that can be thought of. I know of schools in the Philippines that specifically mandate a carless day once a week. Okay, just so that the students reduce footprints, the families of the students reduce footprints to at least create awareness All right. that every Right. Every every move actually has an environmental repercussion. All right. So in a case of a school in Iloilo, every Wednesday is a carless day. That requires students to take public transportation or to walk wherever possible from their homes. Again, this depends on the city. This depends on the physical location of the campus. Okay, they're very good questions that you're raising. But my question, or rather my answer, or your answer, will depend on your campus, where exactly that campus is, right? And what the specific problems can um, are found in the vicinity of the campus and how the university is going to help the campus. Um, is there any other, I don't, let me see, other questions coming up? Not currently, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I said uh, before um, uh, you, you have um, typed your questions, I, I would like to give some uh, ads and comments to, to Professor Calvin's um, answer for the last question. Yeah, I think there is this very good question about uh, the pandemic has re reduced enormously uh, for carbon dioxide emissions uh, because we will re reduce our transportation, our travels, uh, even the manufacturing. Um, but what, how we been to keep and maintain this uh, uh, eco footprints after the pandemic is is. Yeah, I think no. it, yeah, it's quite vital, uh, and it, that's how the university should work together. Uh, just like Dr. Kevin just mentioned, that we uh, should formulate uh, correlations, and because we are doing the research and we know the areas, just like uh, 
Dr. Kevin just mentioned that we know the communities and we know um, what is the uh, extremely weather's effects uh, impacts to the communities. And, and, and we work and we uh, live together with the uh, community leaders. So um, it, it, I think it's, we can do a lot of field studies and, and, and some of the workshops with local leaders or uh, local governments. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we'd like to. Yeah, you know, you know yeah. Right. Uh, and, and Ms. Pamplona, okay. A good place to start, this is this is the uh, objective of the project, a good place to start is, I'd like to ask, okay, any university here in Taiwan or any university in the Philippines for that matter, do they actually know their carbon footprint? Presently knows its carbon footprint. unless I'm mistaken. Okay, what they do know are the kind of projects that they're doing. But as far as I know, there is no university that has specifically studied its carbon footprint. Now, that's a place to start. Okay. If the department says, look, we're consuming this amount of electricity, all right, on a monthly basis. These are the sources of our electricity. If we study, for example, the cafeteria, this is so far the amount of plastic, all right, that we generate as garbage on a daily basis. Right. How are we going to reduce that in, just the, in the next three years? It mm -hmm. all seems so trivial, so simple, and yet it isn't. So you won't let, you know, those businesses will just let go of their plastic. Mm. But the students and the, and, and the businesses will say, well, how are we going? It requires reorganization. Okay. Recycling is, um, is so efficient. Yeah. But recycling doesn't mean that we've reduced plastic usage. On the contrary, it might actually contribute plastic usage, knowing that plastic is being recycled, right? So these are political strategic decisions that have to be made. I don't mm. have what I have, all right, is the first step which is to tell the university, can we come together? If not the whole university, can we come together as a department or as a college and decide, all right, how we're going to be, well, yeah. All right, so here I've got to, can you give some example? Of that? Check the University of Leeds, right? Okay, if you give me, um, give you, hang on, excuse me. All right. Be very specific. Okay. This is, I mean, that's a, that's a, okay. that's a, that's a good question. Okay. Because I've been looking at, for example, the sustainability report of the last two, three years. Okay. And this is the case of, of, um, how's this, of the University of Leeds. Okay. Right. Let's look at student education, okay, and opportunities, which is principle four, okay, at the University of Leeds. All right. Making the most of resources, okay. All right. 
I don't know if that it can be seen. I can't see it. I mean, I can't see it myself. But I can provide you a copy. Yes. Okay. If you can't see it, all right. Let's just look at this. Okay. There's 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 um, campus waste generated in terms of tons. Okay. This includes waste generated on campus, standard operations, but excludes residential hazardous and construction waste. All right, reductions in 1920 likely due to campus closure due to COVID-19, right? Um, in 2015-2016, the generated waste, campus waste was 1,618 tons. By 2000, 2017, 2018, it was down to 1,435 tons. The target, okay, in 2018-2019 was 1,491. All right. They exceeded the target. They were able to lower the waste from 1,491 tons to 1,090.69 tons. Okay, that's one project. So just looking at the waste which is generated by the campus. Okay, um, here's interesting water consumption because now at the moment we've got um, here in Taijong, all right, we've got problems. Uh, we've got a water shortage. Okay. Hmm. All right, so you look at the water consumption of the university. At the U University of the Philippines in the Visayas, we had a water crisis, all right? And we were caught unawares of the water crisis. And here, in total water consumption, this excludes water used for the generating station complex in campus. <coughs> they say, we will look to further understand our consumption patterns and we will look for new and innovative ways to improve, all right? So consumption, water consumption has actually gone down from 6,553 cubic meters, all right, to 5,578,000. Just one more. There is even, all right, percentage of staff and student sustainable travel. So there are cases where, because in Europe, we, uh, we travel a lot for the meetings. But in the case of the university leads, we've also been encouraged to be more selective about the meetings and where possible um, limit travel because you're, again, that's carbon footprint every time you travel and make a plane. So this relates to staff sustainable commuter travel to campus, even. All right. And you just, again, um, when I was a student at the University of Leeds, you would. Um, we would use bikes instead of commuting. Then you can actually use a bike, even during winter. Mm. All right, so that's reducing carbon footprint. Mm. All right. So yeah. these are, you know, check out the report, okay? Because the report is excellent, it's absolutely wonderful. And under each principle, this is what I'm trying to say, let's try to look for a strategy in our own universities, how we can implement that, right? Because again, yeah. every campus, you know, you might not, actually, might not, you know, these strategies are specific to the locality, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because in an yeah. island, you might not be, you know, you might not actually, it might not, you might actually already be using bicycles, but then, you know, you, you might be using boats. Hmm. Right? Yeah. So on and so forth. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think this is also a good question. I, I mean, uh, uh, we have uh, witnessed the uh, very aggressive uh, pro uh, project and commitment from UK government and, and, and the UK university has taken a lead uh, for combating universe, uh, climate change and, and the environment uh, crisis. Um, yeah, I, I think I like I liked your idea of a, a bicycles because, uh, as you just mentioned, that because uh, we are in a tropical weather uh, regions, so you can ride bicycle 
for four seasons. Uh, just uh, yes. for example, like in uh, National University of Kaohsiung, uh, we are not allowed uh, school buses or uh, motorcycles uh, driven in, in, in a campus. So all the students will have to take walk or uh, riding them on bicycles. So well, we have a couple spots uh, yeah. for and, new and Ding Ching, <clears throat> Ding Ching. In, the, in cases in the Philippines, that will require universities to uh, liaise, to coordinate with the local government because they will need bike lanes for that. Mm -hmm. So to be able to do that, you can actually use university, you know, universities that have um, houses that have colleges or research programs in engineering, urbanization, landscaping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, all right. To inform and help the local government to plan urbanization or to contribute to urbanization policy. Mm -hmm. There are yeah. infinitely creative ways of doing that. And in the case, in the times of pandemic, riding a bike or riding a motorcycle even makes more sense hmm. because of social distancing. Hmm. Yeah. And also, I think the, the university could uh, play a role like for experimental. The campus itself could be an experimental site. For example, like in the UK, we have a huge campus and it's closed. It's pretty like a small town. Um, yeah. So it's possible for, um, you know, like our main vehicles, uh, experiment, especially or any electronic buses. Um, so uh, we, we are thinking about these solutions and we work together with government and some enterprises. Uh, we can provide the experimental sites for our main electrical buses. And, and they got to right. transport the students uh, from buildings to buildings. Yeah, uh, so but if it is, it's, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's mm. crucial here, Jing Jing. I'm sorry for interrupting you. And I, mm. uh, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to emphasize that to either the lady or the gentleman. The name is written in Chinese, so I'm not sure, right? But um, uh, the question here: Could you give some example of climate action university? Now, it's important that that is documented. Okay. Because then we're, when you're actually trying to explain how you've made all right, those changes mm -hmm. uh, as a response to climate change, how are you going to influence uh, whether you're actually making improvements or not? And how are you going to make it as a model if you don't have? And that's work for the university. So you, need, you, actually, need, you actually have to put funding in that. This is why I'm saying that um, climate change should be an internationalization. Okay. okay, but we're not sure whether the university is going to listen to that. If we, you know, if we are a coalition, right, then you know we become members, all right, of like you know uh, of of like-minded universities in terms of climate change. I think it's about the time, and um, I would like to uh, once again appreciate for Dr. Kevin's sharing. Uh, about his um, conversation and, and his research in the fields of uh, climate change and the role of the university could do um, even after the post pandemic era. I think there's a, um, how we proceed uh, and, and seeking for solutions. Uh, and, and I think the building up the coalition among the university, especially with the similar uh, weather conditions, is, is quite a uh, a good uh, solutions um, and together uh, uh, integrates uh, resources uh, among universities. Okay, I, and Dr. Tree, are you are you, you are still online? Um, would you like to give us uh, some of the uh, uh, feedbacks or comments uh, before we wrap up this session? Yeah. Okay. Please. Thank you very much, you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I I think that. Um, a very interesting um, discussion. Um, yes, uh, about the coalition. Of course, the Vietnam's um, are very uh, different from the uh, because I think the Philippines and Taiwan is more uh, is uh, are, are similar. They have some some similarities, but Vietnam is quite quite dif different because of the uh, political contests and institutions. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, but I think that uh, because I, I and I, I said in the very beginning I was in the Philippines for almost two three years and I have witnessed uh, many of the hurricanes all kinds of uh, <laughs> uh, national disaster there so yeah earthquake everything and I think that uh, and, and of course Taiwan and Philippines and I said that um, um, so I I learned a lot. And uh, I hope that uh, in the future we can uh, we can work together on on, on this. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Tree. And we, we look forward for a further collaboration mm -hmm. uh, and more in-depth discussion about this coalition of climate uh, action work among the universities. Okay. Um, once again, I appreciate I deeply appreciate Dr. Kevin's and uh, for Dean Tree's uh, participation or the participants online. And uh, before we read up this uh, this week's lecture, I would like to give you a, uh, a broadcasting, I mean, I mean ever, advertisement or a prior notice for next week's uh, lectures. Uh, next week will be our last week of this uh, whole uh, lecture series. Uh, I, I, I do um, enjoy a lot of this journey with you. Um, and for the next week, we will have this closing ceremony uh, to be held uh, at uh, on sites in, uh, of NUK, and we invite Dr. Um, Lin Jingyi. Uh, she she is the ambassador at large, uh, and she's also the uh, former legislator of Taiwan, and she's going to give you a topic um, a speech about the challenges and opportunities after the pandemic. Okay, um, so um, she's also a frequent. Uh, guest speakers to many TV shows in Taiwan and uh, uh, she's uh, discussing uh, 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 about uh, the uh, government's role and government's uh, responses to the COVID-19. So she would be a perfect, um, she would be the perfect uh, speakers um, uh, to this, uh, to this topic. And we also have a special guest, um, Dr. Chen Jianren, uh, for the welcome remarks. He's the former Vice President of Taiwan, um, as, and he's also the expert and in, uh, internationally noted uh, public health scholars. Uh, even he's retired from the post of uh, Vice President, is also uh, working on the researches uh, concerning the public health and pandemic preventions. Um, he's now the distinguished researcher for a genomics genomics research center in Academia Sinica in Taiwan. And also uh, for the closest summary, we also invite two uh, renowned a, um, a violinist, <laughs> the, the musicians for a live performance. And I hope that will be a, a good ending and, and, and wonderful experience for you uh, for the for the closing and for the last week's um, lectures. So stay tuned, and I wish you all to participate uh, our last uh, week's lectures and closing uh, ceremony. Okay, uh, I think it's about time. So once again, I appreciate for Dr. Kevin's and for Dr. Tree's uh, uh, wonderful speech and discussion and all of your participation. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you next week. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you.